So I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's webinar on human trafficking and supply chains. Um, I'm not too sure how my own camera is faring, whether I'm uh, connecting very well or not, um, but I suppose we'll make do as best we can. Uh, my name is John McGeady, and I'm the Justice Officer. I, I'm the Justice Officer with the Sisters of Our Lady of Apostles. Um, so again, I just like to advise you at this time that the webinar is being recorded and live streamed on the OLA Facebook page. So again, we request that you uh, mute yourselves. So if you haven't done so yet, I'd ask you to take a moment to ensure that you're all muted. Thank you. And that will avoid any interruptions. Okay, so this webinar is hosted by the Sisters of Our Lady of Apostles and the Society of African Missions to mark the World Day of Prayer Against Trafficking in Persons, which is held every year on the 8th of February, this day last week, on the feast day of St. Josephine Bakita. St. Josephine Bakita was born in Darfur in 1869. She was kidnapped and sold into slavery as a child in February 1877, and for 12 years was bought and sold and transported multiple times until finally she was declared free by an Italian court in 1890. This evening, we will hear from Keith Adams of the Jesuits Centre for Faith and Justice, who will speak to us about the reality of human trafficking and corporate supply chains. Uh, we will then hear from Sarka Tony of the Irish Coalition for Business and Human Rights, who will tell us why corporate accountability legislation is needed um, as a tool to prevent human, traffic, uh, human rights abuses, including human trafficking and modern day slavery. Following Keith and Sarka, we'll have some time for questions and answers. Uh, so if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat box. Uh, Jerry Ford, the SMA Justice Officer, will be keeping an eye on the chat box and he'll deliver uh, your questions when we come to the Q&A. So finally, after the Q&A, we will discuss ways in which we can take action to advocate for human rights due diligence legislation. Uh, we will then finish up by around 8.30 p.m. So I suppose we'll begin with, uh, with Keith Adams. So Keith is a social policy advocate in the Jesuit Center for Faith and Justice. He's primarily focused on research and advocacy in the area of penal reform and housing. The Jesuit Center for Faith and Justice is an agency of the Irish Jesuit province uh, dedicated to undertaking social analysis and theological reflection in relation to issues of social justice, including housing and homelessness, penal policy, environmental justice, and economic ethics. Established in 1978 by a small group of Jesuits living and working in Ballymun on the north side of Dublin City, the centre was intended to promote social justice and critically examine issues of structural injustice and poverty and the work they do today is invaluable. The Jesuit Centre for Faith and Justice is also a member of RENATI, the Religious in Europe Networking Against Trafficking and Exploitation. So I'd like to thank Keith for taking the time to speak to us this evening. As I mentioned, uh, please submit your questions for Keith in the chat box and we'll come to them during the Q&A. Over to you, Keith. Thank you very much, John. Um, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to have the opportunity uh, to contribute in a small way to this evening's very important webinar. Um, as I've nothing to add to John's very kind introduction, um, I might just get straight into my short presentation. Um, but maybe just to say that in my work in the Jesuit Centre for Faith and Justice, um, I'm mostly concerned with trafficking from the perspective of prison policy and justice. Um, so it's been a great opportunity for me to kind of look into the topic of labour exploitation um, in more detail. Um, and as a lay person working with the Jesuits, um, we always have an opinion on everything. So uh, here's my opinions on uh, labour exploitation and supply chains. Um, so uh, first things first, um, so the first thing that's important to say is that the issue of labour exploitation, human trafficking and supply chains is extremely complex. Um, each aspect can have uh, a huge effect on the other. 
um, entire modules and careers of academic research and advocacy have been devoted to better understand the issues and how they interconnect and impact on each other. So, but within the 20 minutes of my presentation, um, this will be very much uh, an, an overview of the issue, um, a, a whistle stop tour of, of some of the points that I think are, are most important for us to be aware of and to reflect on. Um, so uh, as, as up on the screen, I just have three aims for this webinar or for my presentation. Um, um, it's basically to provide you with an overview of labor exploitation within global supply chains, um, the scale of the problem, and uh, and some uh, some information and helping to understand the factors that cause labour exploitation. Um, so overall, I'd I'd like you to leave this evening, uh, for my part anyway, um, maybe seeing more clearly how pervasive um, forced labour and human trafficking are within um, our supply chains for even the most basic of household goods, um, even our humble shopping trolley, um, which we which we wheel around. Um, grabbing various items um, is often, is, is very much concerned with the issues of justice and exploitation of others around the world as well. Um, so, so this is not, um, and that is to say, this is not to reduce the, or to propose the solution is one simply of individual choices and better individual choices. Um, but it's to say the problem is structural in nature, um, and so that the solution must be structured. And, and this will be what Sorka will be touching on later on, how we can kind of be advocates and how we can engage the government and other policy decision makers at kind of a structural level to address what is very much a structural issue um, and a problem. Um, so I have a few items um, up on the screen. So I would like everyone just take maybe 15, 20 seconds, look at these six items. Um, and just think about how many you've used or consumed in the past month. Um, so we have coffee beans, um, we have clothes, uh, we have chocolate of various uh, varieties, um, we have tomatoes, we have the ubiquitous mobile phone, um, and then we have fish as well. So I think um, I like... Um, as I looked at the list, I've used all these products in the past week um, in some form. Um, so, so some items like clothes are, are essential um, for, for, for the sake of modesty. Um, uh, others like phones are functionally es essential for our daily lives, uh, for our work, um, and for keeping in touch with family and friends who are maybe distant from us. Um, the other, I, the other food items um, I've shown we consume regularly on a regular basis. So some of them are staples, some of them are treats, but they're all consumed. Um, but as, what is common in them all is that like the raw material um, in clothes is cotton. Um, within phones, everything has a raw material behind it. So in clothes, it is cotton. Within our mobile phones, it's a mineral called coltan, which is typically um, mined in... Uh, mined within the Democratic Republic of Congo and um, cotton comes from uh, cotton fields in Southeast Asia. Um, so even, even things that are complex, there's a raw material behind it as well. And these are often, um, these are often most extracted um, most cheaply by hand um, and within countries that labor is cheap as well. And this leads it very open to exploitation as well. Um, so, but, so we're left with the question of who does this work? Um, of kind of extracting and collecting these raw raw materials, um, and how are, how are they paid? How are they remunerated for their work? Um, and what are the conditions of their work? These are issues that um, that should concern us, um, and that we should should have at the forefront of our minds as well. Um, so, so quickly, just to think about what is labour exploitation, because I, as I kind of mentioned um, previously, it, it's a complex issue. Um, uh, the, the definition of terms um, of modern slavery, of human trafficking, of labour exploitation are complex and they're contested as well. So even experts, um, people who, who have looked into it for, for years or decades, um, can disagree exactly on, maybe on what they mean um, and, what the, and what exactly is forced labour, what is um, maybe modern slavery. Um, so these various names, they're often... Uh, they're often used interchangeably, but um, just for the sake of, uh, for clarity, um, I'm just going to use the term forced labour within this webinar, um, because I think it speaks, 
it speaks of labor exploitation, but it also speaks of the um, the coercion and the violence, whether acted upon or not, um, which often accompanies adults and children who find themselves in situations where they are being forced and um, where their labor is forced from them. Um, so I, I'd be using forced labor, but again, as I kind of said, it, it's often interchangeably used with kind of modern slavery and, uh, and labor exploitation as well. Um, so within, um, so forced labor, it's it's important that it's not we're not just talking about um, uh, labor that's substandard or that working conditions that are are exploitative. Um, we're we're talking about something a little bit more um, coercive. So there are restrictions on freedom of movement. There is withholding of um, of wages or identity documents. There's there's threats. Um, there's intimidation. Um, so. And so, so this is kind of what we mean by forced labor. And forced labor then fits um, under uh, modern slavery. Modern slavery is more of an, a broad umbrella term, um, which which covers a lot of different things like forced labor, debt bondage, where somebody accrues a certain level of debt, um, and then they're working back um, over long periods of time to pay back what are often very small debts. Um, Modern slavery also talks about hereditary slavery, so slavery that kind of passes from generation to generation, um, enslavement of children, um, forced and early marriages, domestic servitude, um, and, and also people that are trafficked as well. So this is kind of, these are all the various uh, components, or all the, these are the various strands that are under the broad umbrella of modern slavery, and forced labor is, is one of these strands. Um, and I suppose to, to highlight as well that um, migrants are particularly vulnerable to forced labor um, or trafficking. And as we'll see in a later kind of a domestic case study from Ireland, um, individuals may also be forced into labor in uh, labor or individuals can be forced into labor in their own country as well. Um, that um, somebody very importantly pointed out to me that human trafficking doesn't require um, movement or doesn't require the crossing of a national or um, internal borders. Um, there are many there are many very long definitions of human trafficking, which have many clauses, many kind of uh, uh, provisional statements within that. But but at its heart, um, uh, trafficking and human trafficking is to, is to do with the desire to exploit and to enslave. Um, so people may be considered um, trafficking victims, regardless of whether they were born into a state of servitude, were exploited in their hometown where they, where they, where they were born, um, or whether they were transported to an exploitative situation, um, or even if they had consented previously to the work with the trafficker as well. So human trafficking is, a, is also a broad term. So often we can maybe conceive of it as um, as maybe the the Essex example where many Vietnamese um, migrants were found in in, in a lorry uh, body, um, but these are often the extreme cases. Often uh, human trafficking is much broader than just kind of the the often the very tragic cases which make international and kind of uh, national news as well. Um, so I hope that's a. Uh, uh, fortunately, I've kind of clarified that it's a contested definition. So these are kind of my kind of interpretations of them. So they're very much open for debate and there's much discussion on them. But this is kind of my uh, my basis for kind of the rest of the of the presentation or my part. Um, so so if if we've kind of we've talked about what forced labor is, um, so then we're left with the question: and why should we be concerned with forced labor and human trafficking? Um, with with globalized trade and supply chains which are becoming increasingly complex and opaque um, many of our everyday um, items pass through many different countries for raw materials and processing um, i remember during the height of the brexit kind of debates and that kind of inane debate almost on the northern Ireland protocol and um, there was one example used of a uh, a simple meat lasagna which in in the in the process of it being developed and made for um for a supermarket shelf it crossed um international borders four or five times and um, this is just one simple food product so often often items are moving um quite a huge distance from from the raw materials to the supermarket and back um, but setting aside this often the silly example um 
forced labour and human trafficking is um, is the most lucrative illegal activity after drugs and uh, and the sale of arms. So it's third to kind of the two of the of the most illegal activities, international activities. Um, and the reason for this is that it's profitable. Um, and labour exploitation is it's endemic in global production and manufacturing, particularly in in low wage and in labour intensive industry. So industries such as um, uh, mining, um, which is uh, which is very labour intensive, often low wages. Um, uh, the use of traffic humans can reduce often reduce costs there. Um, in last year. Um, the US Department for Labour, they identified 156 items from 77 countries produced by children or forced labour. Um, and so these are minerals such as gold, um, cotton, palm oil, issues, uh, items which I already highlighted, like um, fish, coffee, chocolate. Um, and it's, it's important just for us to note then as well that one in four of the victims of modern slavery are, are children. Um, so it's not just adults that are trafficked or that are enslaved, it's also children as well. Um, but the but the scale, um, the scale, the scale of people, um, people who are um uh, are, are human brothers and sisters um involved is, re is really eye-watering. Um estimates will always be an undercount in uh, in, in a phenomenon that is particularly hidden, that's particularly illegal. Um, but I suppose the methods are improving, but it is difficult to be to fully quantify them as they are very uh, it's a very um, it's very hidden from kind of our day to day lives. It, it's often carried on in um, it's it's most prevalent within kind of um, the global south um, and another kind of um, nations that are that are still heavily industrialized. Um, so so globally. Um, it's estimated in 20, 2016, the most recent figures I could find, um, that there's about 40 million people in modern slavery. Um, uh, and there's about 25 million people in forced labor. And so these don't include people that are involved that are sex trafficked. These are just, this is just forced labor. Um, and so out of this 25 million, um, about 16 million people are exploited in the private sector. Um, so such as domestic work um, and in the construction and agriculture sector as well. Um, so 16 million out of the 25 million are um, within the private sector. Um, and then another 4 million of that large number of 25 million are um, are enforced labour, which is imposed by uh, state authorities. So um, we'll all be probably fairly familiar with the with the plight of the Uyghur um, population in the uh, Xinjiang uh, province in um, in northwest China. This would be an example of forced labour by uh, state authorities as well. Um, and then just from a gendered perspective as well, um, uh, women and children are disproportionately affected by uh, forced labour as well. Um, often with um, uh, with with often exploited as they try to source income um, for families as well. Um, so it's about ninety nine percent in the sex industry and fifty eight percent then in other sectors as well. So they are heavily represented there as well. Um, so I suppose much. Um, as I kind of mentioned, it's it's one of the most uh, after the sale of arms and drugs, it's it's the most it's the third most lucrative um, uh, illegal activity um, in the world. Um, so much much profit is there to be gleaned and extracted from the suffering of others. Um, and those in forced labour generate about um, the latest figures suggest about forty five billion dollars. Um, uh, each year for the governments and corporations and individuals who abuse human rights and infringe upon human dignity. Um, so this extraction, extraction of profit um, from the exploitation of others uh, has led Pope Francis to kind of to utter some of his the most the harshest words of his papacy, um, calling the phenomenon of human trafficking and labour exploitation as an open wound on the body of contemporary society. Um, so that so that goods produced through forced labour of trafficked people they end up within corporate supply chains, creating wealth and um, for those that already have ownership um, of, of the means of production as well. Um, and then and then I suppose kind of creating the almost a negative feedback loop as well. 
these profits then drive demand for increased human uh, trafficking as well, that it becomes an in virtuous circle of more profits, more demand for human trafficking, and then it just kind of continues to flow and fester. Um, so I'll just uh, I'll quickly slip on. I'm conscious of time. Um, so just a couple of um, uh, case studies, uh, just to kind of uh, highlight uh, a number of things. Um, so I think it was I think it was on the um, uh, um, the OLA uh, Twitter account during the week. They made a really good it was a really good tweet about um, how. Um, how human trafficking is laundered through corporations, how it's hidden in its complexity, um, which I find very striking. So I was, so I find a number of examples. So we're all probably familiar with the brand of Starbucks and Nespresso um, of coffee. Um, so both global brands, Nespresso was fronted by George Clooney, who is um, a famous film actor, but also um, a very noted uh, philanthropist and kind of somebody who was concerned with uh, justice. Um, but then it, it emerged then that uh, children under 13 were working 40 plus hours in, in grueling heat in Central America within in Guatemala. Um, and reports, an investigative report then suggested that there were children there as young as eight years old, earning as little as 31p an hour. Um, but then when we contrast kind of the, uh, the meager sums which um, children were earning um, within what was, a, which was, a, a very acute form of exploitative labor. Um, Starbucks has global revenues of more than $25 billion. Um, so huge, very profitable um, to source to source cheap raw materials um, from, 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 where, from their subcontractors sub within Guatemala. Um, closer to home, um, and I'll, I'll be drawing this issue closer to home as we kind of finish off the presentation. Um, so even our uh, tin tomatoes or our passata um, has justice issues as well. At the end of this, we'll not be able to enjoy anything. Um, you'll be lamenting uh, attending this presentation. Um, so the, the UN uh, Special Rapporteur for um, Human Trafficking in 2018 uh, suggested that there were over 400,000 agricultural workers at risk of exploitation and 100,000 living in inhumane conditions within Europe alone. Um, even in, within Italy, um, there's estimated to be 50,000 enslaved agricultural workers. Um, so so what, what has happened within Italy is um, Italy became uh, some of the largest migrant reception centers are in, are in Italy, in, in southern Italy, within uh, Sicily and Calabria. Um, so they're drawn. Uh, so what happened was, um, I, th I think it was largely um, mafia-based organizations. So the migrants were drew from the migrant centers um, and then uh, they ended up working like 12 hour shifts in 40 plus degree heat. Um, the, the migrants who came to Europe with hopes of, um, of kind of uh, finding a life of, of meaning and purpose um, and probably the means of supporting their families back home. Migrants from Gambia, Ghana, uh, Nigeria, Sudan, all kind of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and they were paid very meager wages, um, which were then used to buy overpriced essentials. So um, even, even uh, uh, personal products and food, um, they paid overpri overpriced um, inflated prices for essentials from their gang masters. So this is kind of like the model of a mine in town um, in, in, in the old kind of uh, stories in the US where people were um, forced to work for very meager sums and then the sums were taken back through inflated costs for essential uh, items that they needed. Um, so within, um, I have a couple of slides left. So within uh, traffic and forced labor, um, it's often differentiated that there's, um, there's push factors and there's pull factors. Um, so I'm just going to highlight, so the pull factors are, are issues like kind of, um, they're always internal things. So if somebody is, they're, they're aspiring to, um, to the dignity of work, the dignity of, um, of a home, of, um, uh, of, uh, of kind of a better life um, from, a, from maybe a life of poverty. Um, so those are often the pull factors that draw people towards um, becoming very vulnerable to being exploited. Um, but there's often push factors as well, and these are kind of structural issues which I kind of flagged earlier on. So uh, the issue of poverty and marginalization, um, gender and age, as I kind of is shown um, uh, 
it being female and being young um, is, a, is another risk factor as well. Um, a weak social network, um, lack of education, lack of legal protection, um, disability leaves somebody very vulnerable to exploitation, um, irregular immigration status, um, and then the political and economic context of a country as well, particularly a country with a high flow of migrants um, and people seeking a refuge in other countries as well, they become very vulnerable to, um, to exploitation as well. Um, so then even closer to home, so um, uh, I've human trafficking is, is kind of that, it's that hidden phenomenon in society. Um, so we know that, um, that particularly cash rich and uh, kind of services such as car washes, nail salons, um, kind of the gig economy as well, um, with kind of very precarious work environments um, are all kind of um, uh, very, uh, not open, but very um, very susceptible to, um, to people being exploited and people being trafficked for the purpose of labor exploitation. Um, so within Ireland, um, there was a case, um, this is highlighted in a report by the Migrant Rights Centre of Ireland, um, of migrant fishermen in Ireland. Um, initially started in 39 hour contracts, which is what have consented to, um, but then ended up working 100 plus hours um, with an average pay of about 282 euro 82 per hour. Um, they experienced verbal um, and or physical abuse um, in order to, um, to keep them compliant and to, to work these long hours. Um, um, and work experience, the work experience and the stories that they told meets the criteria of trafficking and forced labor as well. Um, and there's a potential for about 500 non-European uh, economic area crew on Irish fishing ships. And then if anyone had an undocumented status, this again leaves them very vulnerable to trafficking and labor exploitation. Um, and those that seek to earn to earn profit from human trafficking are very tuned into um, areas of weakness and areas to exploit as well. Um, so lastly, um, uh, just to kind of touch on, um, we're just kind of, uh, uh, I suppose, um, co coming out of um, a two-year um, pandemic, um, all being well, um, that there's no kind of um, uh, kind of reemergence or kind of huge rates of reinfection. Um, but COVID-19 had an effect on labour trafficking as well. And um, so the root causes of human trafficking have been exacerbated. So kind of the push factors, which I talked about, like poverty and marginalisation, um, and kind of uh, instability in various countries, that's kind of exacerbated the root causes and brought it to the forefront yet again. Um, it's created circumstances for employers to um, exploit increasingly vulnerable people and people that are um, just trying to probably make ends meet um, or support family or, or family or send in remittances back home. Um, and then recruitment has also moved further online. So as our communication has moved further online, as we've become more comfortable with Zoom and kind of talking to people through technology. So recruitment for labor exploitation and trafficking has moved online as well. And this has led to even more hiddenness. Um, so, so any estimates on numbers are probably even more under accounts now than, than they were prior to this. Um, so just to hopefully set up Sorka um, for her presentation, um, why is it so difficult to solve? Um, why is it, why has Francis or Pope Francis um, said that this is a fester, that it's an open wound on the body of um, contemporary society. Why is it continuing to fester and grow? And um, so there's three main things. So it's essentially the weak enforcement of the laws. In many countries, the laws are there, but like in Ireland, Ireland has actually, um, has a whole raft of um, laws about, uh, um, uh, to identify the safeguard and to uh, prosecute those found guilty of human trafficking, but there's very weak enforcement and very legal, uh, very weak um, identification of those exploited. Um, socioeconomic vulnerability, um, and then economic and commercial pressures on corporate companies. There's a reason why corporations um, will often maybe turn a blind eye to to maybe dodgy sub subcontractors or maybe rumors of exploitation. There's a pressure to reduce input costs, raw materials and processing costs. Um, but then there's also the temptation to utilize lax uh, labor standards um, or to utilize lax labor standards to reduce labor costs as well, and thereby increasing profit. 
um, as well. And with the increase of profit, then we see the increase of human trafficking as well. And that negative um, feedback loop kind of continues as well. Um, so thank you. I'm, I'm conscious I probably went over my 20 minutes, but that's kind of a very whistle stop tour of issues that I think are important, um, both in helping us to understand um, labor exploitation within global supply chains. And that it's not just, um, it's not just an issue for those uh for people overseas it's also human trafficking is a very real issue within ireland as well um and that's why it's so good that this type of webinar and our previous webinars are happened to highlight this issue as well and um, so i'm going to leave that there and i'm going to hand back to john as well um yes i'm going to stop sharing thanks Thanks very much, Keith. And uh, you're actually spot on time there. So uh, well oh, done. That was excellent. That's very rare. Um, yeah, but thank yeah. <laughs> um, no, thanks a million. And uh, that was really, really engaging. I think everybody will agree. And um, you know, it's really important sometimes to get back to first principles and, and to really go over those definitions like you did at the beginning, because very often that's the thing that we we can we can forget. Um, and then to provide the context of, of what actually that the figures are uh, both globally and at home here in Ireland really is uh, is really really important. So so thanks very much, uh, Keith. Um, once again, if anybody has any questions for Keith um, about human trafficking, about uh, the definitions of human trafficking, um, the the numbers that he was talking about, um, or its its relationship with with corporate supply chains, um, please again feel free please to pop any questions into the chat box, and we'll come to them during the Q and A. Uh, so I suppose uh, now I'd like to uh, come to Sarka Tunney. Um, Sarka is the campaign coordinator for the Irish Coalition for Business and Human Rights. Uh, previously, she has run advocacy and public engagement campaigns um, on the rights to housing, health and anti-discrimination, uh, working with leading human rights organisations and political parties. The Coalition for Business and Human Rights is a new coalition Members consist of union representatives, development organizations, human rights defenders, women's rights and environmental organizations, and leading academic experts in the areas of human rights, law, and business. Uh, members include some well-known organizations, including TROCRA, Oxfam Ireland, Christian Aid Ireland, Frontline Defenders, uh, the National Women's Council, and the Irish Congress for Trade Unions. Uh, the coalition is focused on progressing corporate accountability um, and Irish leadership in promoting business and human rights, both at home and abroad. Um, and that's what Sarka is going to speak to us about this evening. Um, I'd like to thank you, Tor uh, Sarka, for, for taking your time out again this evening to join us. Um, once again, I'd just like to remind everybody um, to please submit your questions for Sarka in the chat box and we'll come to them during the Q&A. And um, I think everybody has remained muted, um, but if not, just uh, make sure to mute yourselves. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, over to you, Sarka. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks very much. And um, I'm going to share my screen in a few seconds as well, but I just want to say thanks to Keith as well. I think you've uh, play, laid it out there perfectly for me uh, to give a sense of the, the global problem and national problem as well, but also I suppose the lack of regulation of this issue and and that's where we come in a little bit so i'm just going to share my screen also and um, I hope you can all hear me, but I think you can and if i'm going too fast. <laughs> tell me to slow down or something, but i'm going to keep it quite uh, simple enough for us all at this time of night. <laughs> um, so this is who we are. So it's as uh, John uh, kindly said, we're a new coalition and um, we're working from a very bringing in various perspectives to this issue. Um, and predominantly, I think we were started by Trocra and a few organizations who saw firsthand the impact of the lack of regulation of corporations across the world. So Today's meeting and today's event is about forced labor and trafficking, but really um, what I'm going to talk to you about is, is a little bit outside that and come back to that as well, if that's okay with you. So just to say the approach taken globally um, over the last 10 years has been to allow corporations to police themselves, I suppose, is, is how we say it. So 
they are allowed to voluntarily um, regulate how they employ people, how they extract uh, minerals from, from the earth, how they use uh, chain global chain markets and how they undertake their business without any or very little oversight. And when there is, it's not really um, implemented. And so this is where we are today in a, in a world that has uh, growing corporations making growing, growing profit, profit, profit and people who work for them, not all, but many of them in, the, in low income countries getting poorer, facing more difficulties, and in some extreme cases, as we see here, losing their lives. So last year, um, 227 land and environmental defenders were murdered on average, that's more than four people a week. Um, this May 2020, the most dangerous year on record for people defending their homes, lands and livelihoods and ecosystems. So this is a key part of the work for us because a huge, um, key organization in our, our group is the human rights defenders who work with human rights defenders, but human rights defenders who uh, attempt to protest against uh, land grabs, forced uh, extractive industries um, are often brutally repressed uh, and many of this, this repression is ignored and the corporations who may be engaged in them along the supply chain uh, get away with it with impunity is the word we would use. Um, as uh, Keith very kindly outlined for us, women are at the center of this issue and women are most impacted by corporate lack of regulation and um, particularly indigenous women and they face losing their lands, their livelihoods. Um, and when they use their voice to protest or to stand up, they're often um, met with repression and reprisals. So we've seen that human rights defenders are killed, that they are that there's a lot of aggression against them, that are corporations tend to be engaged with the local government and, and, and people are left outside this equation all the time. And what we really see is that it's up to the state to really take action on, on this issue. This is a picture of a mine in Sarahan. And, and again, I'm just focusing a little bit on the environmental side and I'll come back to the supply chain side. But Sarahan mine um, in Colombia, it's one of the biggest uh, coal mines in, in the world. Um, it's a coal mine that actually Ireland have, uh, ESB has used quite a lot and Money Point um, uses it to, to, uh, to heat our houses and to give us our electricity and have used it up until five years ago. The situation for the people though in Sarahan is that there are a lot of young people working in these mines, young boys and girls. There are also um, a lot of health issues from these mines and these are rivers flowing into communities. And also this, this land is, is indigenous community land. It's a very special land for other people. And those living on it have been put off their land, I suppose, if, if, you, if you want. And, and they live with a massive help, health impact of, of this corporate uh, land grab, extractive grab. And again, to date, the response from the international community has been to ask them to do it cleaner, has been to end fossil fuel. And as they leave these places, they leave them in, in an awful uh, state where they take years and years to um, clean and make it habitable again. The other side of, of this... If yeah. I can just come in there, Sark, I think maybe if you want to uh, screen share your slideshow, it's not showing up there. If you want to try. Oh, thanks for. Again. Oh, sorry. Ah, you oh. should have said it to me ages ago. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't sure. Oh, I'm so that. sorry, uh, lads. OK, here we go. So I'll, go, I'll show you because I'm all pictures and they're lovely. OK, here. So can you see me now? Thanks very much, John. Perfect, Sark. Um, so this is the. This is around the 227 human rights defenders. Um, and this is a picture of a group of women that we've worked with quite a lot, indigenous, indigenous women who are actually fighting against a, a dam in their area. This is the mine and this is Sarahan mine and this is what it uh, looks like um, now. And, and you can't see here, but like to the left of this picture, there was a young child working in the coal mines coming out all black. A lot of massive health impact from this mine. Again, the community aren't engaged with, they're not talked to and the state will sign away a lot of the right, their rights to for sweetheart deals, I suppose is what you would say where you have lack of regulation again. But this company, that runs this mine sells coal to Ireland, to ESB, but it also has its Dublin offices in Dublin. Um, so they 
bring money through certain supply chains and out through certain supply chains. And that's where the impact is. Yet there's a lot of people in another part of the world making a lot of money from this uh, and those communities aren't. So, look, so, what, so how forced labor and how does that, and we have similar stats, but looking at forced labor, again, there's an estimated 25 million people. So we got the right stat, the same one, which I was wondering about Keith. And of that number, 16 million are exploited by private sector and are forced in sexual exploitation and 4 million are forced. Uh, imposed by state authorities. So there's a lot, and women and girls are disproportionately affected by forced labor. So there's 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 huge numbers out there. So again, we're looking at corporation, and a lot of the time these are businesses, not all the time. We and trafficking is a little bit different, especially sexual ex exploitation, but we're talking about business here. And um, a lot of the time along a supply chain, so a business could be based in Europe, but be, be taking materials from a country in Latin America or, or the global south. And those uh, supply chains are hidden. And so there's no regulation on the global south, but the benefit goes to the people in Europe and they can sell the products. And we don't know what happens behind that. And, and, and I think sometimes a lot of guilt is put on people about what they buy or what they uh, get in the shop. But a lot of the time we don't have, a, we don't know where these products are coming from. We don't know that there's human rights abuses at the other end of these products. And I don't think it's really fair always to blame people for this when there is a lot of corporations and governments that are actually benefiting from the status quo of the situation. I a recent report, which I'd really recommend that you get, it's called Know Your Chain. So it basically, we're talking about these supply chains and, and Keith very clearly outlined that we, we understood them a little more because of Brexit and because of COVID. And now post COVID, we're seeing even more issues around supply chains. But this report um, was a five-year research report on forced labor. Um, and basically it showed that, oh, sorry, that um, 129 companies benchmarked the average score on human rights due diligence was very low and only one in five companies demonstrated responsible purchasing practices. So this is what we're talking about, where they responsibly find out where their resources are coming from, who made them, who built them, was there fair labor, was the land taken fairly, is the environment being harmed? All those questions are never, never asked. And this is why we are, as a coalition, are really seriously calling for a law that ensures that companies do this. So this is also what we're talking about as well. Only half of the top 60 companies in Ireland had looked at their, their supply chain practices and see if they were in line with human rights, if they were impl implicated in human rights abuses or environmental harms. And this is a study we did with uh, Trinity College uh, to look at that and to look at that. And that you have to consider what what we are as a country as well, when you look at the many multinationals in this country and the 10 largest, Ireland's 10 largest state-owned entities were included in this study. So even within our own structures where we could, we would say that we're not a low-income company, we have good governance, we have good democracy, we have a lot of regulation, even within our own, uh, like for example, the ESB, we're not doing that checks and balances along our supply chains. And we are turning a blind eye, I suppose, is what a lot of people would say. So a key call for us working in this area, and I'm just going to check something here, yeah, is that mandatory, not voluntary. So what we say is up until this point, voluntary reporting was asked for of companies and it hasn't worked. So all the cases, examples before, more people are dying, more extractive industries are leaving places because of the fossil fuel changes and leaving them in a very bad situation. Um, and if you see that in... Qatar's hotel sector and the Pacific tuna fishing industry, particularly, none of the checks and balances that we've kindly asked them to, to do to ensure that we are protecting the planet and we are protecting our people are being undertaken. And so for many of us working on, on this for a long, long time, we've, I suppose we've used the carrot to help encourage and consumer engagement, encourage businesses and corporations but it hasn't worked. And we're now looking at a situation where we want to see mandatory checks and balances. And I think the word due diligence, I'll come to, but it's quite hard. To, so it's mandatory checks and balances. So if you were sourcing something, you might actually look, I would look to see where it was coming from and companies should do the same across their whole um, supply chain. Um, 
we also want these to be legally binding. So um, I, I work from I work from a human rights perspective, and for us, the the I suppose the <coughs> obligation sits with the state to ensure to protect people's human rights, and 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 we've always dealt with states, and and this is where the globalization of the world has really changed a little bit, where we're actually now facing corporations as these sometimes bigger than states so they're sometimes more powerful than states sometimes they make more money than small countries uh, if you think of the really big corporations and if we don't ensure that we can regulate them we'll actually lose that balance of power that is really very much tipping away from small pe people with simple requests in life and, and just simple lives and I think that's where we want to put that balance back a, a little bit um, and so we're looking at what um what is what are we looking for it's, so it's called due diligence mandatory human rights and environmental legislation so it is a bit of a difficult one to say or even to understand but it is about processes ident our businesses across their supply chain identifying preventing mitigating and accounting for how they address human rights and potential forced labor risks in their own operations across their supply chains and in their business relationships so who they do business with as well What we are proposing as a coalition, and, and, and just to say, we are proposing at, at many levels. Um, so we are working at the UN level, which we are still waiting for um, a binding treaty, which at the moment we have guiding principles again, which are voluntary, that recommend, that ask, that advise. <laughs> and um, what we're calling for is binding, which means it's legally binding on a corporation to do these things. Um, we're asking for that at a national level, at an EU level, and at the UN level. So there's no transnational regulation at the moment. There's nothing that prevents this at a transnational level. And so we're saying that you need to do it at the UN level in every country, but also at the EU level and also here in Ireland, we need to do it as well. And so the key elements of the law would this would translate to any jurisdiction really is is about establishing a new legal duty for businesses to conduct effective due diligence and prevent adverse impacts on human rights and the environment. So if you are looking to get your chocolate or your cocoa or your cotton um, you have to make sure that the company or the small source person that is making it in a, in a small community is doing um, the checks and balances to make sure there isn't forced labor, there isn't exploitation, there isn't child labor, um, and loads of other areas that I mentioned, like human rights, right to access information about the, um, the industry that's happening, rights to your own land, indigenous rights to land. And a key point of it is, all, is always engaging the communities that you go to, to ensure that they are aware of and consulted on what is happening on their own land. Um, we would like to see a law that covers all businesses and um, I suppose like a lot of the examples, the Starbucks are really, really good, great and we, we really need to regulate that because they have massive and they would, they would see, we would call them high risk um, businesses. But, but also there are some smaller level bis businesses, um, particularly in tech that might not have a huge workforce might be run by a few people but are creating either extracting minerals from a certain area um, or, or doing other human rights violations that may fall through this legislation. So we want to make sure that it covers all businesses, but in a, in, in, in a fair way, and I think we have to say that in a way that is proportional, that we're not asking someone in Donegal with one person weaving um, scarves, that they have to take this onerous duty, human rights, and you know, it's not, it's not ridiculous what we're asking for, obviously, but it's also, it has to be proportional. Um, we want to make sure that any uh, proposed law covers, protects the people and the planet. Um, re requiring re respect for internationally recognized human rights standards and key environmental standards. And this is where this area of work is a little bit unique in, in, in the international work. And I've worked on various international campaigns. It's where it's bringing development, so working in communities, partnership engagement, human rights, and the environment and climate protection, because we cannot address the climate change issue unless we regulate for corporations. And corporations are one of the most significant um, contributors to the global greenhouse, greenhouse rise. So we have to try and grapple with this legislation to ensure that we can bring in environmental and climate targets 
to make sure that businesses are actually saying when I go to that extractive industry and this is for new business too and new green businesses as well because a lot of the um, batteries used to make, make electric cars actually come from quite um, are, are impacting the environment so we don't want to just move the problem somewhere else and this is law or laws like this will actually start to prevent that behavior and it is really about changing behavior to getting people and businesses to think about these these issues and how they can actually prevent that abuse instead of responding to it when it happens and so this is really a preventative legislation as well we we're also looking um to ensure accountability so holding companies liable and and this is uh, this is a very key and i i wonder i would say a lot of you would have a sense of this when you're working in communities that access to justice is a very key component of, of, of anyone's sense of, of um, right or wrong and fairness and, and respect, I suppose. And in, in a huge, significant number of cases where if, if a community or if a person does, I don't know how they do is challenge a corporation, it's very, very difficult. It's nearly impossible when you look and you do see that David and Goliath um, imagery coming in. And particularly if you if you bring it out like a big European corporation or a big multinational corporation and, and a small group of uh, communities trying to um, access justice. So if you look at some of the big spills like the Pubble oil spill, um, that really took uh, many, many years and they're only starting to get so 10 to 15, 20 years before they get decisions. So if you're back to the forced labor aspect, we want people who have been forcefully uh, lay to work in a place or seriously working conditions trafficked to be able to access justice and to use this regulations to, to bring cases and hold the companies to account. And that isn't the company necessarily in their local community. That's the company in Europe or in Ireland that are doing it. And so this is where this is a little bit unusual, where it's transnational laws, where you go across borders and you say, if I am working in Latin America or in Brazil for a corporation that is forcibly making me work on cotton fields, that I can actually take a case to that company where they're based, where their uh, investors are, where, where their money is really as well. And I don't think they're looking for money, but you have to really, have a law that makes sure they're accountable for their actions and, and at the moment most corporations are getting away with impunity um, we also want them to bring effective remedies so that is potentially looking at re um i suppose when you look at a like a, a law case and you look at it you're looking at them before the harm was done and, and at, so if it's a child forced labor like what harm did that work do to them in that two or three years? And you're trying to restore them to the who they would have been. So that kind of access to justice. It also has to be gender responsive as like, as we've all said quite clearly, women are, are the most impacted. They're the most likely to be in poor working conditions. They're the most likely to be in working in their home and um, for long hours on unsecure work um, contracts. And so we really need to engage women and ensure that they're heard in this legal process. Um, and then again, when you're looking back at what I was talking about, the amount of human rights defenders that are, are dying when they uh, bring up these situations, particularly unions as well in low in low regulated countries, if you're working with trying to get into your unions, unions are blocked. Again, we were trying to make sure that there's a safe place for human rights defenders to engage. And when we say human rights defenders, we mean people like me and you who just stand up at a time when they're needed and, and at grave risk to themselves. Um, and then finally, um, the law needs to look at addressing reprisals. So if people, again, were working on a case where a woman was killed, her, her daughter has continued the fight, she was murdered um, in protesting against a factory in her local area um, and the conditions there, um, her daughter is now at risk of being murdered and it's just ensuring that those reprisals don't work, uh, run out to the community um, beyond. So I'm just gonna look at a hypothet hypothetical situation because we don't have the law yet. So it would be an Irish company, company has a subsidiary in a, in a, in a 
country that where they purchase cocoa. The Irish company has published available corporate social responsibility policy and a modern slavery statement, which would, is them saying that they don't engage in any um, actions that would like they don't employ people or make people work in slavery um but it does not conduct a human rights due diligence so it does not it, it makes a statement but it doesn't really do much beyond making a statement and it doesn't really check what is actually happening ultimately an ngo or a community group do a lot of work and produce reports saying there's child labor in that um fact that that, uh, that where they're making the cocoa and where they're purchasing the cocoa that irish company would be responsible um under the law for that for not actually doing proper due diligence for not protecting those people for not ensuring that they're employed properly and that is a, a big that would be massive change and massive change for the communities we work with um i'm just showing you um a slide here about um where this law is progressing, and mostly it is progressing in Europe. Um, so Germany, France, um, and the UK have done the Modern Slavery Act, so it's a version of it, but they're all project progress progressing and Norway due diligence legislation. So we're learning a lot um, from these countries about how it works and what it would look like. There has been a massive decision around Shell under this legislation brought in Holland, in Holland that are progressing it. Um, and it was the first time a community were able to hold Shell, the global oil company to account for the pollution um, that they had, uh, they had, yeah, they had polluted their whole community and they'd taken so long and most of the people in the case had died in, in the process, but they finally won. In France, they're also looking at cases for exploitative working um, against the casino mar supermarket chain that again uh, is, is using products and pr pr uh, purchasing products from uh, companies in different countries that exploit workers uh, and force them to work on farms and in inhumane and degrading uh, conditions. So we're seeing how this law could really have a, an impact. And I think um, just to, to, to also say, that um, because there is such a cry out for this law and because there's so um, much abuse in this area and it's one of the most unregulated areas and um, the European Commission on the back of the European Parliament have just uh, are publishing in a few days the first draft for an EU directive on uh, due diligence uh, at human rights and the environment and it's, it's, a, it's a very big moment for uh, the campaign and for us but it also um, will begin a more global conversation on this because uh, as, as we all know that EU is a significant block, um, meaning block, not blocker, but block in, in, uh, in progressing progressive uh, legislation. And we would hope that then this would be something that would inform the UN because the UN processes uh, is coming next. So we will have a UN treaty on this in the next few years as well. Um, so there is progress. Uh, we are seeing a lot of young people involved in this, realizing that they don't want to be consumers, that they don't want to, um, I suppose, buy products or support corporations that uh, build their books on the backs of people. Um, and I suppose that's uh, where people profit over people. Um, but also there's a lot of work um, with our partner organizations in the local communities um, standing up, I suppose, and asking for this law and asking for corporations to be regulated. I was on a call with a, a, an amazing uh, community from Colombia um, who are were coming around Europe and telling their stories and, and telling how uh, impacted they are by the lack of this and, and meeting politicians. And, and it was really um, impactful, is, is what I'd have to say, and, and to hear politicians actually uh, ask what can I do and, and and if you if you leave with anything today it, it, like I think sometimes we get a lot of guilt put on ourselves as people and in, in our choices and how to like particularly if we're buying products that we can afford uh, and in in the current situation with the cost of living I don't think we should be feeling that guilt but we should be looking at governments um, and corporations to take action um, because the people want this change. And we had a massive polling that 81% of people in Ireland want this change. So we, we need to call on 
governments and corporations to take action on this and make sure um, that we progress legislation that regulates this activity and gets rid of, I suppose, activities by big corporations, small corporations uh, that hurt people and hurt the environment. And that's, I think, me. Yes. Thank you. And sorry about the screen. That was terrible. Uh, no worries at all, Sarka, and thanks a million for um, that really, really comprehensive presentation. Um, I'm sure it's going to be huge food for thought for everybody tuning in on the webinar this evening. Um, so I suppose now, um, if uh, I, and actually there, if you do want to stop screen sharing there now, yeah, Sarka, I'm going to stop. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there are probably quite a lot of questions now, both for your for yourself, Sarka, and also for Keith. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe I might invite Jerry Ford um, to uh, unmute himself and he can maybe begin introducing some of the, the questions that some of you have dropped into the chat box. Uh, Jerry Ford is the SMA Justice Officer. So Jerry, if you want to make yourself visible there. Okay. Hello, everybody. I hope you can see me. You are now, Jerry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a good number of questions. Um, the first one says, thank you, Keith, for your work. I'm working in the USA. And in 2019, it was report, there was more than 4,000 people reported in the human and sex labor trafficking. Is any coalition trying to bring the perpetrators to the public eyes, like the Epstein case here in New York? That's the first question, like it's a, asking, are there groups actively working to sort of deal with perpetrators? Yeah, um, I suppose I'm, I'm I'm not an expert in in sex trafficking, but I I suppose um, um, the Epstein the Epstein case is um, is a very extreme example, I think, of um, uh, of of sex trafficking amongst um, a very global elite. Uh, I think there was I think there was re even more resolution in the Prince Andrew case today. So I think it's a very extreme example, but I think. Within the Irish context, there's there's two things I can maybe point to. I think in, I think it was uh, early 2010s or late 2000s, there was a turn off the red light campaign. I think um, Ruham and various other organisations were members of that, um, and that was looking to bring in legislation to um, to both decriminalise um, uh, people involved in prostitution and criminalise the purchase of of, um, of sex. Um, but then I think there was also a factor, um, there was also an element within the legislation then that, it, that was to deter um, sex trafficking as well. Um, I suppose another thing, just um, I see Gustavo is, is American, so there's the, um, there's the US State Department report, the TIPS report every year as well. So um, I, I quickly scanned it there, I, I was reading the questions, but um, Ireland in the last three years has dropped from tier one to tier two watch list. Um, and at the time the US State Department wrote uh, the TIPS 2000, or 2020 report, there had been no um, prosecutions for sex trafficking in Ireland. Um, and that's kind of been the main reason why um, we both weren't identifying people that were being trafficked and an issue in the proper safeguarding process, but we also weren't prosecuting those involved. So it's actually only been in, I think the last, I think it was only in the end of last year that there was the first prosecution. Two women were uh, were, were found guilty of, of sex trafficking um, in Ireland. So I think that's the first case. Um, but there was huge pressure and I think a uh, real embarrassment because I think Ireland had uh, coasted through on various um, national action plans and kind of lots of documents for a number of years, but actually the reality and um, the reality of what was on paper or what was on paper and what was in reality were two different things. So um, so I, can, I probably can't, I think the Epstein thing is, is probably um, very, uh, it's contextualized to America, but I think those are just kind of two examples of, of where we are in Ireland at the moment, if that's helpful. Um, Okay, thank, thank you very much. By the way, you, you referenced the tips or the TRIPS report. On the SMA and OLA Facebook pages, there's a series of six short videos uh, available looking at Ireland's performance as reported in the TRIPS report. So if you want to look at that, you can, you can look it up on our Facebook pages. And you move on to the next question. Is there any way to know whether or not an item I'd buy has involved forced labor. How can I know? Um, 
circle here. I'll come in a bit on that. It's, it is quite difficult to know. Um, and you're really depending on um, the company um, to tell the truth in this area as well. Um, and it was it's interesting. It's a question that I, I don't know if you know Commissioner Murray McGuinness asked as a politician like we hear a lot from and she works in the EU and she was saying this just that we hear a lot from corporations that they do their best um, and they do x y and z and I don't doubt that and across many corporations it's I'm not saying it's all in any sense of way but but she was like we can't verify that and we have to take their word and, and I suppose laws like laws like I'm not just saying it because I want I'm working on this law but laws like this will actually give a bit more transparency across those supply chains that we see are quite um lack transparency the the best way for someone a consumer to to buy or to just is to find out themselves and look at fair trade like a lot of the fair trade organizations are very uh, very good and um, a lot of companies are involved in corporate social responsibility and and and, and they're they are making efforts so i would look it up yourselves but there's no way like for example i um when i put in my petrol like on in my car sorry i still have an old car um but it says um zero carbon on my petrol pump and uh, this this petrol was brought to you with zero carbon and it's like that's not true <laughs> so like that's like there's a ways of saying things and the advertising authorities you know yourselves can let things be, be said and and so no it's not verifiable um, in a very transparent way but you can do your own research and that report that someone asked that I mentioned know your chain uh, that report actually was quite good in um, highlighting uh, the companies that do the rest in this area and I was quite surprised by some of the companies that do their best like a company like Adidas actually was one that hit quite high and quite a lot of the measures so it's interesting uh, and then finally just on companies uh, that are trying their best so I'm not naming it you know I'm not kicking the companies all the time but there is a, a lot of uh, in the UK they're called the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre they work a lot with businesses on and helping them and guiding them through this and they last week 100 plus of the biggest corporations signed a call for this law because like just to say a lot of companies are asking for this as well and um, because it creates a level playing field for them because there are good companies out there and they're kind of the ones that are losing out the most at the moment because like it do, it is a bit harder it is to make, making sure you work across your supply chain ensuring where the work comes from etc but if you're, you're doing that now while others aren't it's not fair and they're asking for it as well. They're saying this should be fair. So I'd look at those resources to see which companies are really trying their best in the absence of legislation and hoping that legislation will come in to help them and, and support them in doing it. OK, thank you very much. Sort of a, the next stage, if you like. What is the best way to advocate against the sale of forced labour goods? Should we refuse to buy or should we protest, say, say outside Starbucks? And the second part of the question is, are there organized campaigns that we can support to prevent the sale of goods tainted by traffic? Um, yeah, John, you might come in as well on this, but like well, we're working, um, it's a great question. Like we're like we're really working for this legislation and like what, what we're going like, I suppose sometimes boycotts are, are great and they work for some groups, but like as a coalition we're really looking for that structural change <laughs> we're looking for this to be across the board um and yes i think if a company is like is out and out like with abandonment kind of breaking like really throwing it in your face and i wouldn't go near a company personally i don't think we'd we'd actually as a coalition promote a boycott or at the moment um or single out one company, but there's lots of uh, information out there for those who would like to do that. And then just on the campaign, like we are, uh, John will talk a bit about it later. We, just to say, as I mentioned earlier, the EU legislation is being published next week. And once that's published, uh, we will be writing to our MEPs, writing to our parliamentarians and encouraging any and an, anyone who wants to engage just to ask them to take the next step. And it's not in, in any way a kind of adversarial question. I think a lot of po politicians, I've met most of them on this issue are very keen to get this across the line to work with us on this. So it is about saying, 
that you, as a, as as a Christian person in Ireland, that these values that you hold close to you, uh, you want to see this legislation, you want to see action in this area, and you want to see one part of it, corporations being taken out of that ability to abuse people. And I don't know if John, if you want to come in on that. Yeah, probably just to say that we're actually going to look at um, maybe how we can advocate um, now at, at the end of the Q&A, um, which maybe we might wrap up soon enough, Jerry. Um, I know there's quite a few questions there, so we'll maybe try to get through as many of them as we can. Um, but yeah, we, we'll talk about that just after the Q&A um, about how we can actually get in touch with our politicians. And I think as Sarka said, it's not necessarily combative. Um, it's simply that it's important that politicians know what's important to you because they, they they need to know and they want to know what matters to their constituents um i don't know if keith wants to come in there on anything yeah I, um i would just come in to make the point that i think um i think some of the research of um of climate change activism is important here as well because i suppose I'm, I'm very heartened um and encouraged to whenever sort of outline the campaign as well that it's very much engaged at the structure level of um because I think some like some of the research around climate change activism has kind of suggested that the early focus on individual acts like recycling and, uh, and not using uh, particular straws and things has has led people to kind of think that once they do that that's their bit kind of done um, so that kind of that's the kind of avoiding a particular product or a good or a boycott um, might not have the impact that you think it'll have but whereas um, like John was saying, engaging policymakers at that level of this is what's important to you and kind of seeking change much higher up um, and towards the, um, at, a, at a higher level of the supply chain as well, I think is, is important. Um, and I think that's what climate activists are just kind of, are, are, have kind of learned over their time. And I think it's, it's very encouraging that, um, that this campaign is starting at this point. So um, that's my observation. Okay, thank you. Uh, quick question. Keith, Keith said that there were lots of laws in Ireland, but they are poorly enforced. Why is this? Um, I think I'll, I'll get myself in trouble. I'm, it's not my, not my area of expertise. Um, I, I think, to be, to be honest, I... I, I don't know. I, I'd be. I'd be very. I'm just low. I'm loath to kind of say it without. I. I don't. I don't know the area enough to kind of say it definitively. Maybe Sor Sorka or John can speak more um, intelligibly to it. I just wouldn't like to kind of apportion blame just in an area that I'm not um, fully knowledgeable about. If that's okay, so I might just opt out of this one. Um, um John, do you, are you? I don't mind taking it, but if you want to, or yeah. Um, so what the question was, why are they not implemented? Um, like if you're talking about the criminal offences, which uh, Keith mentioned earlier, so the around uh, sexual exploitation, the new law came in, um, criminal offences uh, and sexual acts, I think law uh, in 2015, I think it was, and it's up for review at the moment. Uh, and I think um, it's fair to say that I, that may be working uh, well enough uh, for those who wrote the law and ha how it, it was intended. And so there has been uh, convictions and the purchase. So trying, I suppose it's about behavioral change around purchase of sex. Uh, so that I would say is probably one that there was cross government support in that and, uh, and that law has been successfully, successfully implemented. And there's a good oversight. A lot of the, so there's a good group of people that are engaged, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, civil society, and they watch how the law is implemented and they have an independent chair. And um, I think that kind of like across the board and not just in this area, there's a lot of laws that aren't implemented uh, in a way that you'd like to see. Uh, I, I suppose when we when uh, Keith mentioned that we moved in the uh, from very high risk from America, and I remember that in the news for trafficking, um, what a lot of organizations would say is that push pull factor again, if you're talking about migrants and trafficking, again, that is about having safe places and safe access uh, routes for people, uh, for migrants. Uh, and again, to remember where people are coming from, what they're coming from and to enable access to employment, to um, 
not to direct provision centres, obviously, but to, to, to society. And I think uh, we're also, I suppose, implementation is difficult because we have been in a global, we're very, very, very difficult period globally. And I, I don't think um, anyone can say that without with, with wars and um, and climate change is also co is causing a lot of uh, mass migration as well. So I think there's a conflation of issues and, and maybe uh, like finally, uh, and we'll see that from co this from COVID in Ireland, a lot of organizations working on Irish domestic issues will say there isn't a lot of data collected in this country. So we're not really sure always what we're dealing with. Um, and, and so the, like having research on exploitation, on numbers of traffic, on entry points, on exit points, on exit routes, all those re is really helpful. Okay, thank you very much for that. It was a difficult question. And I suppose there's another one that's it's difficult. And is there resistance to due diligence law? And if so, what is the extent of the opposition? Um, yeah, like there is a massive corporate resistance, um, unfortunately. Um, so for example, as I mentioned, the European law, um, the whole, and every Irish MEP uh, signed uh, a progressive legislative framework for this that like was welcomed by every, by one side, particularly by the by the parliamentarians, by lawyers, and uh, it went on to the commission and has been blocked for about a year and a half, nearly two years, which is quite unusual. And the understanding is that a lot of uh, si significant corporate lobbyists uh, got involved, and I suppose they don't like it's not all and it's hard like so there's a bad group of actors in this it's not all corporations there's what there's the organizing um particularly in denmark and some of the nordic countries they had a lot of issues around uh engagement and i suppose they're trying to say like that a lot of the i suppose analogy is that corporations might leave your country so in bulgaria and all, so if you implement these laws you will lose business and you will lose jobs and you will lose so that kind of narrative comes out quite a lot um, but the research, like, and all this has to be evidence-based, a lot of the research is showing that it isn't actually those, like, the sky doesn't fall down, and France has legislated, and Norway has legislated, and Denmark, you know, all these countries are legislating, and actually businesses aren't running away. So I think it, there's high-risk industries that it's going to be very difficult for them, and I think the future for some high-risk industries is, is very difficult, and, like, I suppose, like, I don't know if you know the phrase just transition, but it is, it's for both sides of this or any sides or coin or flip, like you need to be meet people where they're at and walk with them and bring them. And that's what would be the Irish coalition's approach. We should engage business. We should hear their concerns. We should listen to them, but we should also be listening to communities and, and, and trying to bring those two perspectives. But there is a, a there is a, a, I suppose, a block coming from certain groups. Okay, thanks very much for your answers. I don't think we have much more time left to each other. We better leave it there, I think. So thanks very much to those who put in the questions. And of course, thanks to Keith and Sarah for your replies. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jerry. Um, and thanks very much to Keith and Sarah for, for your answers. Um, and to the very engaged audience for posing the questions. Um, I suppose now uh, we are conscious of time, but there is a kind of a final part of this webinar uh, this evening, which is looking at how we can engage in advocacy. One of the things that came up in the, in the Q&A there. And um, so we're just going to consider how each of us can take some steps to advocate for better policies um, and especially for human rights due diligence legislation. Uh, the legislation being called for by SARC and by the Irish Coalition for Business and Human Rights. Um, so we'd like to invite you to join us in a specific act of advocacy, something that you can all, we hope, do. Um, and what we've actually done is we've written two draft letters uh, that we're asking you to send, one to the Minister of State for Trade Promotion, Digital and Company Regulation, and that's uh, Robert Troy, TD. And then the second letter is to Ireland's MEPs. Um, because obviously we want domestic legislation, as Sarkis said, and we also want EU level le legislation. Um, and in fact, EU legislation is about to be published. Um, but that, that's only the beginning point. So it, it needs support to get it through. Um, so Sarka, perhaps you could comment uh, again, maybe a little bit, uh, uh, sorry, you sort of already have covered it, but if you want to say anything more on, you know, maybe why it's important to engage in this sort of advocacy um, and maybe also why we've chosen these specific targets. 
Yeah, thanks, John, and and thanks for helping us with this. We're absolutely delighted that you're you're um, willing and, and able to share this letter with this with this group. Um, as John said earlier, and I think it's something that we all need to hold on. Um, politicians want and 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 should hear from us. Um, and hear what we, concerns us and hear what motivates us. And, and it's not about winning or losing votes. I'm, it's not really about that. It's just like, it's, it's about taking the temperature of the population. And if this is something that really um, motivates you or something you feel strongly about, um, Ireland is a great little country in that sense. And, and, and a lot of my EU colleagues are quite jealous in the sense that when like action towards our advocacy is really quite, um, impactful in this country and I and from my perspective like I know I talk to a lot of politicians and receiving letters um, and as John said not necessarily mass emails like sometimes it's only two letters on an issue but it's the two people that took time to write those letters and really communicate that they want them to do something on it and and like even even if you got a response saying I'm not sure if I'm going to do anything it's it's asking them to think about it and to show people care um so so from my side advocacy really works when you have people alongside you um I and I really believe in that and um, I so Robert Troy, obviously being the Minister of State, this is uh, it, it is it is I suppose it's a portfolio that sits with the Department of Ed Enterprise, and um, because it's about business and enterprise and trade, and he will be the lead politician now. Obviously, there's a reshuffle in the air, but let's not go. <laughs> let's just focus on the now. That's what we can control. Um, so he was one of our key targets, and then the Irish MEPs, as I mentioned earlier, the Parliament have passed this law. In, in, and the EU process is quite uh, complex and difficult, but he passed, they've passed this law, all Irish MEPs have voted for it. There is worry that it'll be water, like made a little bit weaker. Um, and so once it's published, the MEPs will be again discussing uh, what the commission have put together. So they put it forward to the commission. Commission took it off met with business, met with people, met with us, met with others and came back and said, this is what we think the EU should, should now do what your proposal. And so now it's up for the parliament to come back to the commission and the council will be later on. So we're asking our parliamentarians again to our members of Ireland, the European parliament to stand up and say, yes, this is what we, we wanted and, and stick to your guns a little bit. So we're not asking for anything really more. Like, I think that part's done. We're not asking for better law. We're just saying this is keep this, hold this line now. This will work for women, men, people, corporations, and it's, it's, it's impactful. So there. Okay, thanks very much, Sarkis. So um, my colleague, Michelle Robertson, has, uh, has actually just popped uh, three Word documents into the chat box, everybody. Um, and maybe, Michelle, you might just do it again as well so that it's there for everybody. And really what we'd ask you to do is to just download those um, documents now, if you, if you, if, if you don't mind. Um, so the first is the letter to uh, Minister Troy. The second is the letter to the MEPs. Um, these are two draft letters, okay? And then the third document is, is actually the list of the Irish MEPs addresses uh, for contacting them. So they're in the chat box and if you could please download them now. Um, and then this will be what we're asking you to, to send. Um, and of course, that's entirely up to you, um, but we would really appreciate it. And you know, the way we see it is you've taken the time to join us in the webinar this evening. You're obviously interested in, in this issue. You feel that it's an issue of justice. Um, and so we're hoping that you'll join us in taking action on this. Um, so I was going to uh, go through the letters, but maybe we're running a bit short in time, so we won't bother with that right now, okay? Um, but suffice to say, um, they advocate for the law that, that Sark is talking about, this due diligence law that it's, that's before the European Parliament. Um, and also with, with Minister Troy, uh, the letter advocates for, for similar legislation to be brought forth domestically here in Ireland. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, you know, the OLA sisters and the, and the SMA fathers, um, and indeed the Jesuit Centre for Faith and Justice, we're coming at this from a, from a Christian perspective perspective um, and that is uh, you know that's present in those letters um, but certainly uh, we'd like you to to personalize them um, as you see fit um, so that they actually speak to your values so 
Um, essentially, we're asking that you send them by post as letters rather than by email. Um, and this appears to have greater impact. Uh, however, something is better than nothing, you know, so you do what you can. Um, likewise, we're asking that you send the, the letter to Minister Troy and also that you send a letter to each of the Irish MEPs. Uh, because obviously, if the, the more contact you make with the more MEPs, the greater the impact you can have. Um, so again, uh, we really would appreciate if you would take that action. Um, as I said before, and as Sarka echoed, it's really important to let our elected representatives and our government know what we, what we think and what we want and what we value. And it's really important in a democracy for them to hear from their constituents, um, and especially on an issue of profound justice, like when we're talking about. Um, so essentially, that's the ask that we're hoping that you'll go away with tonight and act on. And finally, um, you know, hoping that you do take this, uh, this uh, step and send those letters, you will hopefully receive some responses. Um, and we would really like if you could inform us of those responses, because that allows us to sort of chart uh, the progress that's being made and to get a sense of how impactful this active advocacy actually is. Um, and indeed, to inform all of you again afterwards how impactful the, this act of advocacy was. Uh, so I think that's everything. Um, I suppose we have a couple of moments. Um, does anybody have any questions about that uh, before we move on? No, okay. So then, very simply, um, what I might do then is just ask if uh, if Sarka or Keith, if either of you would like to make any final comment. Um, I suppose I, I would just I would just make the observation that um, a letter writing campaign to a politician can be a very impactful um, act, um, especially when it, there's collective kind of action behind it as well, because. Um, uh, politics is quite, or the political circle in Ireland is quite small, and I suppose, um, like Sorka mentioned, there's uh, reshuffles coming up. There'll be there may be elections sooner than we imagine, kind of thing. So, um, and re-elections often hinge on a small number of votes, and then suddenly you have a couple of hundred people writing you letters on a topic that's very important to them, both um, personally. So I think, I think that it can be very impactful. Um, so I, I suppose I just encourage people. I, I think it's a very, it's very, it, it's nice to kind of, uh, I think, I think I just to go away and have something very concrete that you can kind of do. Cause often you can, uh, I find that I attend lots of webinars and you leave and you're just not sure what you can kind of do mm -hmm. afterwards, what am I meant to do? But, um, I, I just think there's a very, um, it's a very constructive, concrete action to, to take. So, um, yeah, so that, that's just an observation, really. Um, thanks very much, Keith. Yeah, same. Um, and just thanks a million, uh, John, for everything the last few days as well and for helping us with this. Um, and sorry, I didn't share my screen, but that's and that's OK. At least you could see me. <laughs> but um, on, but yeah, no, really, if you if you can take a moment, but even being here today and and another side of this is, is sharing this conversation with your friends and family, um, because that's just as important for many of us as well um, to have to, to grow our mo movement, I suppose, and and to ensure that a lot of people are aware of some of the issues that we talked about tonight. So thanks very much. And maybe just on that point about sharing with friends and family, um, you know, these letters, you can also share them with your friends and family and invite them to do the same thing. And in fact, uh, what we'll do tomorrow is we'll send an email to everybody on the call this evening um, with the letters and, the, e and the, the postal addresses for the MEPs and also a link to the recording of this webinar. Um, so if you, for any reason, are not able to download the letters from the chat box, that you'll receive them tomorrow by email. So again, um, yeah, please take the action um, and support this important cause. Um, okay, well, I hope you all found this uh, evening informative and engaging, and I especially hope that you've been inspired to take action. Um, and of course, we look forward to hearing uh, on how you, about how you get on. And please do let us know um, if you receive any responses. And I'm sure you will receive responses because that generally does happen. I mean, uh, Irish politicians in the UK do that way that they, 
they acknowledge and they respond. So uh, please do share that with us. Okay, I think that leaves it uh, for me just to say thanks a million, really, to Sarka and to Keith uh, for your contribution this evening and uh, and your, your knowledge and all the information you've shared with us. Uh, thanks very much to um, Jerry for assisting with the Q&A and for all the behind the scenes support in putting this together. And also talking about behind the scenes, thanks to Michelle Robertson, the OLA communications officer for all her support as well in putting together this webinar. And thanks all of you for joining us this evening and taking time out to engage in this important conversation. So good night and God bless. <laughs>